you have massive volumes of oil moving around the country in ways that fundamentally aren't as safe as they could be. The people who are supposed to be ready for it weren't. Firefighters didn't know about it. Mayors didn't know about it. The people who make sure the state's ready for oil spills didn't know about it. You know, crude oil wasn't supposed to explode until it started exploding. The volume of crude oil transported over North America's rail lines has exploded in number. Since 2008, there's been more than a 4,000% increase in crude oil traveling through communities in the United States and Canada, and not without problems. Trains hauling oil are derailing and exploding, resulting in severe environmental damage and more unsettling, human casualties. We're here in downtown Seattle. It's game night for the Mariners. Right over there is where the Seahawks play. And what most people don't know is that right underneath us, there's train tracks that carry oil trains next to two major stadiums. I've seen a lot of stuff in local news uh, across the nation that has depicted a lot of uh, train wrecks that have involved oil and things like that. That could be devastating. It would crush half of downtown Seattle. Train tracks run through the heart of Seattle and right next to the city's two major sports stadiums. On average, 20,000 fans show up for a home game at the ballpark, and over three times that to support the city's champion football team. But trains were never a concern until they were hauling oil. From the Seahawks stadium, you could probably throw a rock and hit an oil train um, from the top of the, uh, the upper decks. They're running right through the heart of populated areas. Eric DePlace is the policy director of Sightline Institute, a sustainability think tank in Seattle. He's been tracking the expansion of oil by rail in the Pacific Northwest. Right now, we're really at the tip of the iceberg. So uh, we've seen this incredible growth in oil by rail. We're up about 50 or 60 times beyond oil shipments by train that we had even just a couple of years ago. And as it grows, we're seeing more and more of these derailments and explosions. So why has there been an increase, you know, in the U.S. in general? Uh, the increase is largely driven by uh, production of oil in regions like the Bakken Formation in North Dakota. That oil, we've known it's there for a long time, but it was difficult to extract it. The Bakken, an oil and natural gas formation, covers parts of western North Dakota, eastern Montana, and parts of central Canada. For decades, the oil and gas industry knew these fuel deposits existed, but until recently, were unable to extract them. Hydraulic fracturing has caused an oil boom in the Bakken, making North Dakota one of the top domestic oil suppliers in America, second only to Texas. The boom has meant big money for the oil industry, and some say will put America on the path to energy independence. But oil fracked from shale formations is full of volatile gases, making it more similar to jet fuel than traditional crude oil and by its very nature, extremely flammable. Moving all that oil across the country is daunting. There hasn't been hard pipeline infrastructure in place that's adequate to serve the um, demand for the oil producers. So the railroads sort of stepped into the breach and began playing the role that pipeline companies normally do, and they began moving large quantities of oil by train. The dominant way that uh, we have moved crude oil and ethanol and some other products uh, is in this old type of rail car called the DOT 111. The Department of Transportation 111, or DOT 111, is the workhorse of shipping crude by rail in America. But federal safety investigators have known about their deficiencies for over 20 years. In a 1991 safety memo, the National Transportation Safety Board found that the inadequacy of the protection provided by DOT 111A tank cars has been evident for many years in accidents investigated by the safety board. The car's heads and shells are thin and prone to puncture. Protective housings around valves and top fittings are not robust enough to prevent impact damage. The handles that operate bottom outlet valves often open during derailment, spilling the liquid contents of the rail car. Combine highly flammable Bakken crude and the deficiencies of the DOT 111 rail car, you have what critics are calling bomb trains. 
We've seen now uh, with five catastrophic explosions in the last 12 months um, that when these things derail, uh, they don't always burst into flame, but when they do, it's catastrophic. Y a vraiment beaucoup de chaleur. By far the most horrifying accident uh, with an oil train was in a little town in Quebec. It slipped its brakes, rolled into town, derailed, and when it blew up, 47 people were killed almost instantly, leveled four blocks of town. People were horrified, uh, and there was a lot of questions about whether or not something like that might happen again. Uh, as it turned out, it did happen again in November. An oil train derailed in a trestle in Alabama, burst into flames, fell into a, a river. Uh, in December, an oil train uh, derailed outside of Fargo, North Dakota and exploded catastrophically. In January, a train derailed in New Brunswick, blew up. And then just earlier this month, a train derailed in Lynchburg, Virginia, right next to downtown, fortunately not killing anybody, and also burst into flames and fell into the James River. The fires can be so dangerous that first responders can't even approach the blazes. Uh, these are, you know, my bunking pants and boots. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I got my jacket, helmet, and my face piece. Kenny Stewart is the president of the Seattle Firefighters Union and a lieutenant in the Seattle Fire Department. He's one of the many first responders all over America who are concerned about the influx of oil trains running through their communities. He offered to show us a few spots in Seattle that worry him most. Uh, well, this is uh, Golden Gardens Park right here. Um, that's uh, Puget Sound, and we're looking at the Olympic Mountains. So then right next to the beach, what is it, about uh, 100 yards away is, uh, is the train tracks uh, where the trains run. And uh, the trains come through fairly regularly. Uh, we see commuter trains running through, and apparently now we have oil trains running down the tracks on a regular basis. And you, you know, you live right by here, right? I live right up the road on top of the hill here above the tracks. How do you feel living so close to the train tracks? Uh, I think, uh, you know, my kids love the trains. We like hearing the trains. It adds to the, the feel of the neighborhood. Um, and we're here at the park, and the trains come by. You know, what kid doesn't like to uh, uh, see a train hurtling down the train tracks? Right. Um, but all of that changes when uh, we see the, uh, the threat that these oil trains um, bring. And the companies don't let the neighborhood know, hey, these explosive oil trains are coming through your town? Uh, if I wasn't a firefighter, I would have no idea that oil trains were going so close to my house, so close to the park where my kids play, and so close to uh, beautiful Puget Sound. Seattle Fire Department is prepared for an, a large emergency like this. We're just not as prepared as we should be. That might be a train coming right now. There we go. Until recently, citizens all over the U.S. and Canada have been kept in the dark about whether or not oil trains are running through their communities. Oil cars right there. Firefighters are one of the few groups who are notified when oil trains are coming through populated areas. Previously, the only way to determine the train's cargo was to read the tank car's DOT placard. Information about oil train routes is still not widely available to the public. The DOT uh, just passed a, an emergency order mm -hmm. to notify states when Bach and Crude is coming through their jurisdiction. So, to, you know, That happened responders. on May 8th okay. or May 7th. And they also um, have put out an advisory uh, to producers or transporters um, to try to avoid using uh, the uh, DOT 111 cars, right. those older cars. They didn't say you can't use them, they said try to avoid it. So right. still, if you're somebody who's trying to get this stuff to market, you're going to use whatever cars you have available. And they can't make cars fast enough right now. Yeah. They cannot get the Bakken crude out of the fields and uh, to the refineries fast enough. What's the earliest date if everything went as quickly as you can move it? What's the earliest date at which we could have a standard, new standards? Let me go back to... No, just, the early, just give me that. What is the earliest date? We could have some certainty. Right now, there's so much uncertainty. People aren't going to make the investments in safer cars, and we're going to keep running these crummy 111s as they are and killing people. It seems like there's a lot of finger-pointing going on. I mean, the National Transportation Safety Board is saying we need safer trains. The AAR is saying the same thing. And there seems to be a lot of weird miscommunication. But, you know, who's... Like, who is it on to really fix these trains? Like, why is there such a communication breakdown? Ultimately, on some level, it's the, it's the responsibility of federal regulators. It's the responsibility of the Department of Transportation at the federal level to say, no, we're not going to allow these to run anymore. 
Um, the reason that happen hasn't happened so far is because industry lobbyists have been effective in stalling them. The American Association of Railroads, for example, um, will make some noise about warning safer tank cars. But if you actually look at the testimony they've provided, um, they're not planning uh, to you know, take those cars out of service anytime soon because their, their industry components that they represent don't want to do that. They want to continue making as much money as they can by running oil trains. Why is there such a resistance to you know, change the model of, of the car to something that can be substantially safer? The resistance mainly comes from the fact that it will add some expense and delay uh, because it costs you know, tens of thousands of dollars to build or retrofit a rail car. Uh, and then, it, of course, it delays how much, they can, how much oil they can ship uh, in the interim. In 2011, the industry introduced an update to the DOT-111, known as the CPC-1232. Companies now have the option to purchase newer cars that supposedly address the safety concerns of the DOT-111. But the price tag is pretty hefty, weighing in at around $120,000. Or the companies can shell out twenty dollars to $30,000 to have each of their DOT-111s retrofitted. If those companies were really interested in upgrading their fleets to the CPC 1232s, uh, they could do so now. They could take the old ones off and not run them anymore. They're not doing that. They're going to build new rail cars, but they're not going to take the old ones off. Even the new ones uh, have safety flaws too. In April of 2014, a train carrying crude oil from the Bakken region in North Dakota derailed and exploded in Lynchburg, Virginia. While there were no casualties, the tank car spilled 30,000 gallons of oil into the James River. 14 of the 17 cars that derailed were of the new, safer variety of rail car, the CPC 1232. The incident created doubt if any version of the DOT-111 was adequate for carrying crude oil safely through America. Refineries and export terminals in Washington and Oregon are the closest to the Bakken deposits than anywhere else in the country. The oil is loaded onto trains in North Dakota. It travels west across Montana through the panhandle of Idaho and enters the state of Washington near Spokane. It then heads south and snakes its way along both shorelines of the Columbia River, traveling through the scenic Columbia River Gorge and onto Vancouver, Washington. At which point, the tracks curve north towards facilities at Grace Harbor and the five refineries located near Seattle on the Puget Sound. Or they continue on towards the Pacific Ocean, terminating at Port Westward in Oregon. Urban areas aren't the only places at risk. Several rural communities are also on the front lines. We drove south from Seattle down the I-5 to where the Columbia River and the train tracks that run along it divide the states of Washington and Oregon. It's here at Port Westward where the Columbia Pacific Biorefinery is located and where many oil trains terminate. We hopped a boat with Jasmine from the Columbia Riverkeeper to get a closer look at the ethanol plant turned oil terminal. The terminal, the oil terminal, was built to be an ethanol refinery with about $20 million in taxpayer green energy credits. Operated for about a week, went bankrupt, uh, and then was purchased by an oil terminal. And now the same facilities, the same permits that were used to bring in ethanol are now bringing in oil. So the, the name is a little tricky. People call it the Columbia Pacific Biorefinery uh, because at one point there was expectation that it would make ethanol. It never has, it never will. It's an oil terminal owned and operated by Global out of Albany, New York. The facility, now run by energy supply company Global Partners, has been transferring oil to ocean-going barges since Oregon's environmental agency approved an air quality permit change in June of 2012. Without any public comment or review, the agency cleared the way for trains to begin hauling volatile crude oil from the Bakken straight through the middle of several small towns and precariously close to the Columbia River. We're 50 yards, some of the best juvenile salmon habitat on the lower Columbia River. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, this area, and this is juvenile salmon habitat. This is not oil spill habitat, but if they keep bringing in the trains, it's just a matter of, you know, of time before this whole area sees an oil spill. What kind of an impact would, you know, decimating the salmon population have to the community that is around here? And the Columbia River has the largest salmon run in the lower 48. If we lose that, we lose the entire fishing economy. We lose our recreation economy. It's not always a matter of adding more jobs when these oil terminals come in. It's often a matter of taking away existing jobs. Global Partners continued their rocky start at Port Westward by illegally moving five times the amount of oil that their permit allowed. 
They're now seeking a permit that will bring 50 trains per month through the surrounding communities and along the Columbia River. The entire oil by rail industry has been cloaked in, in secrecy without any accountability. The terminal there really started operating without anybody knowing what it was moving um, or what risks it had introduced to the communities along the way. Rob Davis is an investigative journalist at The Oregonian. His reporting has been instrumental in understanding the secrecy surrounding oil by rail in the Pacific Northwest. The Oregon Department of Environmental Quality allowed this rail facility um, out at Port Westward to switch from ethanol uh, loading onto barges to loading crude oil. No public hearing, no public involvement, no discussion about it. Um, just a routine permit change that happened within three weeks of the request being filed. Oil trains showed up without anybody knowing they were coming. You know, I've talked to folks in Rainier and St. Helens and Scapoose who were sitting at uh, stoplights waiting for trains to go by, and they had 110 black cars on them. They didn't know what was in them. And what's Oregon's policy been towards crude by rail? You know, there has been an almost wholesale lack of awareness around the country of where oil trains are going. I've been researching it for uh, the better part of four months, and it has been an onerous task to figure out who's hauling what where. The Oregon Department of Transportation has um, fundamentally tried to obfuscate this issue. My first call to them was just to say, hey, there are oil trains here, what's the deal with them? And they said, nothing to worry about. We've got it locked down. Uh, we've done inspections around it and everything's fine. They have actively fought to keep oil train routes and volumes secret. The federal government had to step in and require them to talk about where they're moving this stuff. Addressing communities' fundamental right to know took an emergency order from the Department of Transportation in Washington. Coal, oil, gas, and shall pass. As oil train routes are slowly being released to the public, communities all around America are realizing the potential human and environmental costs of shipping crude by rail and voicing their concern with the very agencies tasked to guard the environment and their personal safety. Hey, Governor Kay, tell Big Oil to go away! We're sending a message to DEQ that they absolutely cannot permit oil trains. Um, they're explosive, they're extremely dangerous. Uh, reports say that there's more oil spilled by rail in, the, in this past year, in the past 30 years, and we're coming to show them that they absolutely cannot permit these and we won't let them. Activists and concerned citizens have started to focus on fighting infrastructure expansion to slow crude by rails momentum in the Pacific Northwest. Hi. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I am your new employer. We are forming a new agency, the People's Agency, and despite your termination of employment here, we'd like to offer you a job with our new agency. We'll be doing business in the lobby shortly if you want to come and see what we're all about. Deny all permits for coal, oil, and gas infrastructure! A key project in the region is the Tesoro Savage Terminal, proposed to be built in Vancouver, Washington. It is the largest terminal uh, that's uh, proposed in the Pacific Northwest. You know, it's been a divisive issue in Vancouver. There's this jobs versus environment dichotomy for all of these major projects. You know, the rail line in Vancouver is a fundamental part of the city's identity, but when you talk to city councilors there, the emerging safety issue around crude by rail has turned that project and others from being this kind of esoteric environmental discussion about the role that transporting fossil fuels has in exacerbating climate change to a question that, you know, folks in the city council are being asked in the line at the grocery store, you know, whether oil trains are going to blow up and kill them. Um, and it has absolutely changed the tenor of the debate about that project. So it basically goes over to where, you know, that big group of trees over there includes that big group of trees. Okay. Barry Kane is the president of a real estate development company. His firm is responsible for a $1.3 billion redevelopment of Vancouver's waterfront, less than two miles from the proposed oil terminal. 
And so when this is built up, I mean, these, these trains would come right next to the development. Right. Some of the trains will go, you know, the, the, currently the trains go on that second. You see, you see it's two different. Oh, uh, yeah. They go on that second one, and they go off that way. The ones that are going to would stay here, if, they, if the port got its terminal, it would be closer, and then be follow our property line. Yeah, stones throw away. Yeah. Barry gave us a tour of the 32-acre site. It will be transformed into 22 city blocks, 3,000 residential units, a 200-room hotel, and other businesses. Ten of these 22 blocks will be within 100 feet of the tracks. Being a proponent of economic development, he supported the oil terminal and its promise of jobs. But that was until the disaster in Lac Megantic. It happened two weeks before the port had a public meeting to decide to sign the lease with Tesoro. And, you know, all of a sudden, a, these oil, an oil train, just like the ones they were proposing to come in, wrecks and destroys the whole town and kills 50 people. That woke me up a little bit. So I, I went to the hearing and, and said, well, you know, why don't, we, why don't you just hold off a little bit until you know for sure uh, this is a good idea. Maybe, maybe there is a safety issue. And everybody initially is saying, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, let's, you know, what's wrong with that? But then as you start getting in and you're seeing the accidents and seeing that <laughs> the oil companies, they, they don't care that much about the future of this area. They just want to get in and get the bucks. I'm sorry, that that's, that's what they want out of this. And they'll say, oh, it's never going to happen here. Uh, and, and the more accidents that happen, the more it's clear that they can't do anything about the accident. They can't stop them. A few years ago, almost no oil was being hauled by trains in the U.S. Now, at any given moment, an estimated 9 million barrels are moving over the rails throughout North America. Just 20 miles down the river from Vancouver is the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area. It's home to the windsurfing capital of the world, the best salmon run in the contiguous United States, and now the largest pipeline on wheels into the Pacific Northwest. First responders are underfunded and unprepared to protect us. Government agencies are keeping secrets. The industry is protecting profits. Meanwhile, regulators are scrambling to catch a runaway train.